Hi guys, uh, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Richard Proctor. I'm the uh, general manager of healthcare for Hortonworks. And uh, I saw a lot of you guys at breakfast this morning, so good to see you again. Um, today we've got something I, I really am anticipating seeing again because yeah, I think it's a really great place for people who are just starting their journey uh, with Hadoop to have someone be able to take, take from day one of their journey uh, through to where they are today. And for those who are a little more advanced, uh, to give them a chance to see maybe where they are, engage where they are in this journey. Um, so today I have Charles Boise. Uh, Charles was formerly at UC Irvine. Uh, he's now over at uh, Stony Brook where he's the chief data officer. And we're basically gonna go through the journey of having an infrastructure uh, that wasn't really capable of future needs uh, for the hospital system and where they went uh, to Hadoop and how that's developed now uh, into their, their standard practice of use. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you guys can all hear me pretty good. So, uh, you know, a couple of things about me first. I started, I started life as a clinician, so I'm actually a trauma critical care nurse. Um, I ran the trauma unit at LA County USC Medical Center for, for many years before I crossed into IT. So I come at this from, um, as, a, as a patient advocate. Um, so everything I've done on the IT side has been generated, uh, you know, around that. And, you know, I'd like to share with you, you know, a quote from, um, from Edison, um, you know, way back when. And this is really, you know, where I want to go. This is where I really want to take us. But we've got a lot of patients that are not well right now. And we've got to do something to, to change that model. We've got to take care of them. And as the next generation comes up, we've got to, We've got to ensure, you know, personalized medicine. We've got to ensure that our patients, our people, you know, have what they need at the, you know, as they're developing. And really, to be honest with you, my goal is to catch people when they're, you know, from, you know, three, four, five years old. And because we have this connection, mobile connection, as they, they grow, we can keep that going and keep them in a state of wellness. But for right now, my focus has to be on the population that isn't well. And we've got to move them and get them in a, in a better place. So um, I got involved with this in 09 and 2010. First of all, how many people in healthcare? All right, oh, this is gonna be great then. So um, most folks know what a continuity of care document is, right? A CCD document, we're all pretty familiar because of meaningful use. Our um, organizations have had to produce this. So basically a summary of care, um, XML, um, you know, very well defined. So I started looking out and looking at you know, different um, you know, technologies then, and I had a hypothesis that I could store these CCD documents in an environment that's outside of the relational world in a NoSQL environment, and I could do two things. One, I could query and bring results up at some second time. Second to that, I could bring up uh, an interface that would allow two things to happen, a clinician, to actually interrogate the data to find things out about their patients, because right now, or at the time, you know, a patient can't go up to the EMR and say, you know, EMR, I need all my patients that haven't had an A1C in the last six months. They have to go to a report writer, and we all know what that looks like. So what I wanted to do was to be able to, in a simple form, have a clinician make that type of query and then bring that back. So then he could, you know, his staff could, you know, contact those patients and do what they needed to do. Secondary to that, um, because I also have a, a research bent and I work with research, I wanted a researcher to be able to interrogate a set of data, a cohort, to, to derive a cohort, but be able to um, de-identify a presentation, which this allowed us to do. So I worked with a Dr. Naveen Ashish. We actually accomplished this with several hundred thousand CCD documents. We were able to query on the, on the um, clinical side as well as on the research side. And it was a very, it was a large advance for research because in the past they would have to go through laborious, um, you know, methods to get this data. They either get counts, but they really couldn't, you know, filter out their cohort through the IRB process and all that. And this actually became part of the IRB process where um, they could interrogate the data into, in its completeness and allow for them to, you know, find their cohorts and whatnot. Okay, so with that success, I was very happy. I used MongoDB at the time with a Lucene type um, to, uh, uh, UI on top of it. Uh, so then I started going out and you know, I started thinking about things. I started thinking, you know, our HL7 lab messages are, are pretty short and succinct, not too much different than a Twitter message. 
And if you think about our LinkedIn profiles, right? We all have LinkedIn profiles. Not that much different than a laboratory, uh, excuse me, a, a radiology report or a pathology report with headers and certain subsections and whatnot. Yeah, we're able to go to LinkedIn and put in some criteria and get that stuff back and it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, then went out and talked to the folks at Facebook. If you think about Facebook, it's temporal, right? Over time. Episodes of care over time. I go, wow, we got the temporal thing you know, kind of taken care of. And then that brought me to Yahoo and then the discovery that there was this thing called you know, Apache Hadoop. Um, this is way back before you know, Hortonworks and, and others were around. So I just started with the, um, with the open source, whatever what was available at the time. Um, and so I started working with that and I really got into you know, the, not only the patient side, but the external data. And in this case, um, I got really into the um, social media data. So Health and Human Services asked for, had an ask to develop an application that could mine social media, Twitter primarily, not for predictive work, but to make um, sense out of the large amount of noise. And basically to pick out a signal over 25 diseases if we could then you know, identify where an outbreak was occurring or some things might be occurring. Um, so we did this. Uh, myself, uh, another in nurse informaticist and undergrad, we built this now trending 2012 application we won. Um, but that's not the important part. The important part is I was able to do this with some tools and technologies that were not available to me you know, you know, prior time. Uh, so that was cool. We got going um, and then I really got into it. So. Um, I've had, I got, had some successes, and if you think about where we are now in our current environment, or where we've been, but our, our EMR, our CERNERS, our EPICS, our all scripts, um, this is kind of cool, we can name names here, um, they're really not designed for the things we really need them to do. So we can't do anomaly detection with that environment, uh, machine learning, or even you know, complex stuff. Yeah, there's some simple rules and alerts, and I've built a lot of those rules and alerts out in those systems, and I've taken them as far as I can take them, but there's always a, some type of impact on the transactional system, right? And we can't, of course, we can't do any type of pattern, pattern set recognition. We can't do you know, graph analysis or, or things like that in that environment. And mostly on our um, EDW side of things, we have some latency for the most part. Um, it can be 24 hours, it can be a week, it can be several weeks, it can be a month. Um, but our EDW does serve some excellent purposes. It helps our folks in operations, um, our clinicians, as well as you know, quality and research. So I'm not advocating for you know, throwing out one or the other. I'm advocating for uh, another ecosystem that can exist and um, supplant or be adjunctive to, to both environments. Um, and for me, big data is not you know, the volumes and all those kinds of things, but it's an ecosystem that does a bunch of things. Um, it plays well with the technologies we're talking about, but you know, at UCI, I had a um, relational, I had an SQL replication of the EMR in that environment. It worked fine. Um, um, I can use my analytic tools, you know, my, ret my um, retrospective type tools, such as R, SAS, SPSS in those. Um, and again, MapReduce, uh, now Yarn, you know, Mahout. I even, have, I even have some use cases where I bring data up from HDFS and, and put it in Mongo for specific purposes and whatnot. Um, you know, graph type databasing and, and whatnot. So, you know, anything that you kind of need to do, you can kind of do in, in, in this world. Um, uh, and again, it's, it's a, for me, it was really a complete, completeness of data as well and why I was really, I gravitated. So if you think about it, um, and I'll use our laboratory message for, for instance. Um, if you think about a lab message coming from the lab system, that lab message has the time the order was written, it has the time the blood was drawn, the time the specimen hit the lab, the time it was accessioned, the time it went to the analyzer, the time that the result was ready, the time the tech verified it and sent it out to the EMR. The EMR doesn't care about that stuff. A good percentage of that gets stripped off. So you get the time of ordered, you get the time that's resulted, that's it. But for process improvement, it would be really nice to understand that temporal view of where that, you know, that lab made that trip. Um, so this allows us now to take, and we had a very good speaker yesterday from, from uh, you know, the folks at Mayo, and they've done some phenomenal work with uh, HL7, and you need to really look that up. Um, but it now allows us to take all those HL7 messages out in their completeness, um, in their entirety, and allows us to store them in their native form, or you know, some derivation, we can run them and you know, represent them as JSON and whatnot. Um, 
And again, when we bring that data from those source systems into the EMR, we make choices about what goes in. Very much is true with our EDW. We make choices with that data that goes into our EDW. And something comes along a little bit later, and, um, and I've been in that boat because EDWs was, was my thing before all of this. Some new system comes in and it's like, oh my God, now I've got to figure out how to tweak the model a little bit. Um, and that's not a lot of fun. So again, a, a system that's able to ingest our healthcare data, both internally as well as externally, and store it in its completeness, in its, um, in, in its total. And again, you know, I, I say, you know, I don't have to leave anything behind. Um, I bring in OR, humidity data, temperature data, you know, and we'll get into some of that in a little bit. But anything you can capture, you can bring it in and put it. You may not have a use for it right now, but, you know, I have no idea where the future is going, but I'm really happy that I initially streamed in data from physiological monitors, you know, three years before that I, I needed them, because then I could use that data for retrospective analysis and do some other things will it be. So, um, so for me, you know, we've got to be able to serve a lot of people, right? We have to serve operations. We have to um, be able to take care of our clinicians, our researchers, and really now our patients in real or, or near real time. Um, and again, we have to be able to do a platform that allows us to do the work that we need to do to build those algorithms. Um, so we need that complete set of data, and we need the people around to be able to do that. Um, and again, we started, a lot of us started with the potential, you know, re, uh, predicting readmissions and, and things of that sort, but we'll go into some, you know, a little bit more, you know, more advanced stuff and whatnot. So for healthcare, I did have some guiding principles because in healthcare, what are we doing? What have we been doing? We've been meeting ma uh, government mandates to, you know, slam these systems in as quickly as we can to get meaningful use funds and things of that sort. And um, these IT folks are, are completely encumbered. So if you think about um, you know, getting the stream data from the interface engine, it, at UCI and at Stony Brook, it was a day and a half to two days time for those folks to clone those interfaces and then point them somewhere else. It's a very simple process to clone and point, and you know, we're done there. Um, on the taking data from um, the EMR, it's a little bit different depending on whether it's Epic, Cern, or Allscripts, and there's some, there's some ways around that. Um, again, um, S open source code that's supported, not open source code that, you know, you gotta have a little bit of, of an engineering team, but, you know, folks that you can just like pick up the phone if you're in trouble and, and, um, and take care of it. Um, and again, to ensure that everything we do, we made sure that it was compatible to uh, vendor products so that our existing as well as our potential future, you know, products. So if a vendor comes in, and they, you, know, you know, the problem in healthcare is we get all these one-off things, right? Where the vendor comes in, we really love the application, but now we gotta throw a server and another instance of Oracle or SQL or whatever the heck it might be. So I've taken a different approach where when the vendor comes in, okay, we'll take care of the, we'll supply your application with the data, but we'll do it on our terms. And this allows you to do that. It allows you to get up to speed a little bit quicker be, because of that. Um, in the infrastructure, we all know this, very much you know, low, low cost, low commodity. I will be honest with you that I do a lot of this work in, in VMware because the latency is not that much of a factor in my two environments. So for me to spin up a, a VM environment, is, is, it works fine. And the degradation in performance isn't enough in, in my case to, um, um, to worry about it. Now, um, these are old statistics from, from Yahoo. But you know, when I was asked if it was scaled, this is what I always gave as an example. And you know, they may have doubled it. This is a couple of years old. They may have doubled it, maybe. Um, and this is something that we can do in a cloud. I know in healthcare, we're all afraid of cloud, so we use the word hosted because the folks in the C-suite, oh, hosted, that sounds great. But you say cloud, and then all the lawyers jump out of the woodwork, and it's a, it's a really bad scene. So, um, so use the word hosted. But there are a few cloud providers now that are signing, you know, pretty extensive BAAs and, you know, kind of taking us off the hook. And there's some that you should, you know, kind of take a look at and whatnot. Um, um, data sources. So we can kind of go into the, some of the data sources. And we had a, so I talked a little bit earlier with some folks about the le legacy systems. So that's how I got into UCI. I told them I will retire legacy systems at a cost of about 500,000 a year. I will make that information viewable 
within the EMR, as well as accessible within the uh, folks in medical records, the HIM folks. So we did exactly that. But what it gave me, it gave me 22 years worth of data, uh, 1.9 1, 1 million patients, 9 million records that I now have, you know, not only just for view, but I have that repository, I had that repository for our researchers. Um, and that's pretty powerful, because now they can look at, you know, 25 years of, worth of data within that environment. HL7 we talked about, um, EMR data. So at UCI, it was all scripts. Um, just really quick, the rendering on the screens was a X, in an XML format. So I just co-opted the stored procedures and used that as, as an extract, so into XML. Um, device data. So I worked with the device integrator, and there's a couple of them out there, and we've gotten them both, well, there's actually three, but two of them will actually do this for you now, where they'll actually take your um, physiological monitoring, your ventilators, your pumps, and they'll stream it right to whatever, wherever you want it. In my case, it, you know, in the Hadoop environment. Um, I did it in one minute intervals. You can go down to sub-second if you like, but you know, I couldn't find a reason for that. Um, uh, so social media data, and we'll kind of get into a little bit what we did with that um, for, social, for sentiment analysis as well as, um, well, I'll talk about it right now, what the heck. So, so I work with a lot of students, right? And um, we do projects together. And so I wanted to build out a sentiment analysis dashboard for UCI. So we started bringing in Twitter feeds, we Instagram, uh, we did some uh, crawlers, uh, crawlers against um, WordPress and others, as well as RSS feeds. So we thought for marketing and communication, this is gonna be great. We're gonna show the organization um, all the great things we're doing, and if there's something that was negative, they'd be able to get in front of it. Great idea, right? But what we discovered and what we didn't intend to discover um, not only at UCI, but in other healthcare organizations around us, and then we've taken this you know, na at a national t for research purposes, patients and families are tweeting from the bedside. I'm at Hospital X, uh, my mom needs pain medication, we're in room whatever, nobody will give them to us. Um, all kinds of things like that, and then taking pictures. I have a nice photo album of sleeping clinicians throughout the United States where <laughs> families have actually snapped shots of them and put it on Instagram, so very, very interesting. But Back to the point, um, this is an environment where we can store that kind of, uh, of data. Our home monitoring um, data, so our Fitbit, our scales, and the rest of it. Um, there's a company called Validic out there that produces a HIPAA compliant pipe, so you can go from the home into your, your, your Hadoop environment, um, do, do a real nice job, and um, I use them. So, um, and then the real time, our, you guys, are, we're all putting in RTLS systems. A lot of times it's for asset tracking, some of us are pat tagging our caregivers and our, um, our patients. And if you can grab that data and you can do a lot of things. You can understand patient throughput, how a patient through goes through your environment. Um, you can understand if you set the parameters, how much patient um, interaction time with, with clinicians. Uh, you can actually on the, uh, the, the Epi folks um, can actually use this data to get a little bit of handle on nosocomial infections and how they traverse through the um, to the organization, uh, you know, basically, you know, who's washing their hands and who's not washing their hands. Um, and then whatever is in your environment that produces a signal can go here. Um, so we do a lot of work on this 30-day readmission. Um, um, you know, we're all doing work on that, but there's variables that people don't consider. You know, if you have, you know, phone calls in, phone calls out, not who they're calling, not what the numbers are, but just counts and you have an understanding of visitors, you can get an idea of what a social network they have. Um, that with other geotype data will help strengthen your algorithms on patients that are likely to per, you know, come back and whatnot. Um, some newer ones. Uh, we talked about the, oh, GIS data. So let's take the, the, the temperature by, by zip, uh, temperature, humidity, um, pollen counts. Um, air quality, and let's put that together, and we built out an uh, app for asthmatic, juvenile asthmatics. Um, you wake up, you look, you can have a crappy day today. Um, your mom gets a message that your kid's gonna have a bad day. Make sure there's an inhaler in the backpack, and there's one, um, there's one at the school. Uh, uh, omic data, um, and you know, if you think about the open data that's available to us, we can use it to, to model things. Um, there's even ad, uh, open adverse uh, drug data that you can bring in and use that for 
you know, things, you know, against your population. And then the whole Internet of Things, this is the absolute ideal place for this. You know, whether you're using Spark, um, Storm, whatever those components are, this is, this is the place, and these are the newer sources. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the use cases, the ones that I really like. Um, so the, there's, a th there's a thing in healthcare in, in a hospital situation called a rapid response team, and I'll go through it really quick. Um, a rapid response team was, was developed so that we wouldn't get to the point where we're banging on your chest and pumping you with full of drugs to get you back. It was so nursing, when they noticed that a patient was starting to deteriorate, could call a team together to figure out what the plan is. Do we need to put them in a higher level of care in an ICU? Do we just need to you know, change their you know, therapy? And what we found over time was that initially the rapid response okay, this is working great, our code blues were, were dropping off, but over time we noticed that it was kind of changing a little bit, um, and we were getting more code blues, and the rapid response was were dropping off, and it was, it was a social thing. It was actually a, a human behavioral thing. Uh, nurses were kind of getting pelted a little bit because they would call this rapid response team, and the folks would come, ah, oh, that patient's not that sick, what are you doing that for? So they, you know, they, the bar you know, it was kind of set that, you know, they better be pretty serious. Um, so what we did with that is by taking all this data and noticing these um, subtle changes, just giving some information back, you know, in the last hour, your patient, you know, heart rate is, is decreased by, by X um, or increased, um, blood pressure has dropped, urine output has dropped, um, you know, those types of things. And, um, and, and we've, had, we've had some success with that. But there's still a lot more to, to go there. Um, early sepsis detection, especially in the ICU environment, by taking, so the human being is not really good at, at reference points. So if I look at you right now, your set of vital signs, and in 15 minutes I look again, I've got that last point. And if I keep going down the road, I lose sight of that po first point in time. So I, I can, because I did this, this is what I did for a long time, I could miss those subtle changes over time, where a machine will not miss those subtle changes over time. And we're doing a lot of work with understanding those subtle changes over time and how they work against the other, um, you know, serious criteria with, with sepsis so that we can take that point in time, maybe bring it a little bit further because we all know with sepsis, the quicker we find them, the quicker we treat them, the quicker they'll respond. Um, and then again, on the, on the research side, a, a much larger set of data that we can actually um, de-identify at the, at the presentation layer. A lot of us in ac academia and the medical side will have a research data warehouse and an operational data warehouse. This allows you to have both, you know, at the same time. And then where I think we're, you know, really going is really, again, starting out at that very young age and then directing people um, over time. So event-driven event care over time. Um, if you're going off the deep end as far as diet and whatnot, that's an event. We, you know, kind of guide you in, in, in the path. In the hospital, as you're traversing through the hospital, if you think about uh, care is very much event-driven within, within that space. So, you know, keeping people um, informed, notified, not nuisance-type information, but information that they can actually use. Uh, rules and alerts, with all the alerts popping up, this is not what I'm getting at. This is, and we'll kind of get into that in a, in a second. Um, so some future ones, uh, I've done some work with a company called Sensium. They have a patch, and others are making them, that we can put for 150 bucks. It goes on the patient on the general ward, so we get heart rate, we get temperature, uh, we get respirations. So that's very, very valuable. That information streaming in. If a patient gets pain medication, we don't see a change in um, heart rate, we don't see a change in respirations, then you know, maybe it's not effective, because we're not really good about asking them and going back there. But on the other side, as far as the safety, if we give them a little bit too much, and now they're um, breathing at four, you know, four respirations a minute, we need to you know, take care of that. And on the temperature side, we do this kind of a thing where we go around and take temperatures in a general floor, right? It may be four hour intervals, maybe eight hour intervals, but you can spike a temperature within that. So by monitoring a temperature, and then pushing um, that information out, as soon as the patient spikes the temperature, we can kind of get on top of it. Um, and then, you know, the c combining of the geno, uh, genomic as well as um, phenotypical data. That's not something that I am doing, but that's something that, uh, that others are doing. Uh, and I think I'll leave the, 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 the last one with uh, threat analysis. So if you think about a patient in your environment, they're at, they're at 
you're a threat to them the minute they walk in your doors. We know, we all understand that we, you know, and it's been said, you know, it's a 747 every three days dropping out of the sky because of medical mistakes and errors. So quantifying that so that the staff is aware at any particular time what their threat is to, to a patient. So we're doing a lot of interesting work on that. Um, edge and vertices or a graph analysis. Um, again, understanding clustering of patients with like, like um, so the nearest neighbor modeling of you know, like patients with specific sets of um, providers. So you think about it, when you go into a hospital, your care is determined by when you got there, what team is assigned, you're gonna be placed randomly based on where a bed's available, and all the staff that's assigned to you is pretty much you know, randomized. Uh, so really, really understanding those teams that work together, those teams that don't, and, and why. So within this environment, you can put years of experience, credentialing, um, certifications, you know, all of this kinds of stuff that can help you really understand who those high performing teams are. And, you know, those are the, you know, why do they get the best outcomes? And, you know, as far as the, you know, best practices in, in things of that sort, we've taken a little bit of a different approach. There are best practices that are expert driven, but we're finding that the a priori approach or letting the data kind of speak for itself yields a lot of information too. And now that we've got this, we're able to do the, you know, the data mining. Kaiser does this very well. They find their practitioners that have extremely well, good outcomes and then they go out and study them and then they generalize that. So um, uh, imaging and, and analytics. So um, Dr. Saltz at Stony Brook, we've got a, a, a nice grant with imaging. So initially we started with pathology images uh, and then moving on to uh, radiology images. And what we're doing is we're taking pathology images, breaking them down into RDF triple stores, and then running them through several algorithms to highlight um, hotspots within the morphology of the slides. Um, and what we're gearing up to do is at some point in time, not a machine to be able to read the slides, but a machine assisted or computer assisted you know, reads. Um, and others are doing this as well. Um, so that we can identify those hot spots. Because when you get a slide, you can immediately derive quite a bit from the, from the morphology. And that might be a quicker directed approach to therapy as opposed to you know, some of the molecular work that needs to be done to, to gear therapy. So it's just something that you know, we're doing, but images you know, play well. So these images, um, I think I have, um, and these can go up into the, to the petabytes. You know, we, we also do imaging within you know, the, the galaxy, believe it or not. So we actually have a 10 billion plus um, RDF triple store of the Milky Way. Um, so we try to break these things, and so far we haven't been able to break you know, HDFS. We actually broke Mongo though, but they came out and fixed it. Um, so, so imaging analytics is, is, a, is a large part of this. Um, so this is something that I learned. So I spent, um, I spent two weeks ago, I spent um, time with um, Citibank, I spent time with Swiss Bank, um, Capital One, all the financial guys, FedEx, all the logistics people, manufacturing and life science. Um, Hadoop and these technologies have been part of their DNA for three or four years now, and they're not going anywhere. And that really gave me a lot of confidence. But one thing that I, I got from these guys, especially on the insurance side, is they're creating um, patient personas based on the information that they have, as well as the information they're able to extract um, you know, from the, you know, the data universe, if you will. So they basically um, do a psychometric profile on their, their clients, on their people. And it's not, the, it's, it's, for, it's not for malevolent reasons. I mean, it's, it's for good reasons. So that they understand um, you know, what they're into and how they can talk to them and things of that sort. So very similar to us, a lot of our, a lot of our interactions with patients and whatnot, you know, we only know so much about them or what they tell us. So this you know, may guide us to you know, what their interests are, where they live, where the parks are. Um, you know, where the stores are, you know, where they can shop. I mean, there's just so many different things that, you know, this GIS and, and other data can help us with um, really understanding the, um, the condition. So, you know, if you think about it, we're, we're gonna mobilize healthcare. You know, we're gonna bring it to the, you know, the phones. And even, we've, and even you know, people ask me, hey, what about the, you know, the, the lower socioeconomic folks? I go, look at, you know, they have cell phones that have text messaging, utilize um, SMS. So we can do a lot with SMS directed um, um, therapy and or advice and or, in many, you know, India, Pakistan, Ecuador, um, um, parts of Africa have done phenomenally well with SMS. So 
Um, again, going back to this, I believe that it's going to be at their point, and we're going to keep them well, and that's going to be you know a big part of it. But we can learn a lot by understanding what our patients are doing outside of our environment. We won't get into this. This is on their website, but this is basically you know Hadoop within our entire environment, in our our own environment. So you know, on the left, you guys. We have all of our you know, normal repositories, and I'm not an advocate of you know, changing any of that. Keep it there. Um, we got all our traditional sources as well as our, um, our you know, non-traditional or our newer sources or things that are gonna come up that we have no idea what they're gonna come up. But you know, all into Hadoop, we do um, push everything out to our normal. And then on the top, you know, for the analytics and whatnot, you guys all have you know, huge investments, whether they be with you know, Cognos, um, you know, you know, business objects, Tableau, whatever they might be, by all means, utilize what's there, Microsoft report writing services. There's absolutely no reason to throw any of that away. Um, you know, and you know, you, I use R because, you know, it's an open source thing and whatnot, but um, whatever that platform is that you use for your, your model building and whatnot, by all means, continue to use it. Um, Let's see. Okay, so I really wanted to kind of, I'm gonna make a leap now because we've got a little bit of a problem, right? We can do all these wonderful magical things, but we need to get this into the EMR. And it's really important. Um, I've done it with um, HL7 in the EMR. I've done a lot of different things, but both Epic and Cerner have adopted two technologies. One is the fire standard, HL7, as well as a smart container. And you know, for us here, this is our way to develop externally to that environment and push it back into the environment. So what Fire allows us to do and what the smart container allows us to do is to get and put data, get data from their environment and as well as put data from their environment. Absolutely crucial for us to you know, build applications and layer them in there. So I'm not gonna go, you know, RESTful API, I'm not gonna go into it you know, too, too much, um, again, smart container. This is all developed out of you know, partners. So um, a lot of this is going on. So we're doing it at Stony Brook. Um, Guy Singer Intermountain Health is probably here. Uh, so there are a lot of people working on this. So this is um, something that's been adopted again by Cerner as, as well as Epic. Um, so doctors, I gotta give doctors Huff and Macaulay you know, credit. They um, actually did this presentation at HIMSS this, this past year and I was able to, to moderate it, but these are you know, kind of their slides and whatnot. Um, and I just wanna give you an example. So this is a, um, a smart growth chart. So this is a growth chart within Cerner's platform at Boston's Children, which is you know, much more rich, richer display than they would have ever got with much better content than they would have got within the EMR. So basically it's a good, it's a good example of um, developing something externally, but you know, now we have a container to do this. And, this is, this is absolutely essential because outside of this, it's a little kludgy getting things back into the EMR if they're kind of closed. Um, within the CERN environment, you can use M pages and other techniques. I am not as familiar with the, um, with the, um, with the Epic environment, but you know, there's some challenges you know, there as well. Um, really quick, I just wanted to show you another use case and what um, we're using this for in the state of New York. Um, so the CMS is given the state of New York uh, $8 billion as part of this district program. I always forget the acronym, so I'm sorry. But we're charged over the next five years, we did it in California, to reduce hospital, um, potential hospital admissions by 25%, as well as ER visits for a specific population, uh, Medicaid, dual eligible, that means Medicaid, Medicare, as well as um, some of the uninsured. And the reason I bring it up is we've got 387,000 lives to, to, to manage. And for Stony Brook Medicine, which is the lead, I've got 200 entities with 200 data sources. So 12 hospitals, 40 some skilled nursing facilities, behavioral health, community centers, rehab, um, and then as you know, many practices, both small and large groups. So I'm, there's the IT architecture, but I'm not gonna go through it. And what's important is there is a big data platform in this, and we feel that we would not be able to accomplish what we need to do with this patient population without it. So um, at the base of it, you know, feeding up 
the management tools as well as the patient portal and all the tools of care providers, the clinicians and others are going to be using is this the data platform that, uh, that will feed it. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff. We have to connect them to a local um, um, exchange. We have to get them to meaningful use stage too, but there's a lot we've got to do. But I just kind of wanted to you know, point that out as a, um, you know, as a really good use case, because we're all getting, so your ACL model, we're all getting into that, and that's a you know, big data challenge. Um, so I also was able to attend the 5G summit, and um, Gavin Stone from, from, Edi from Edico um, really, pinpointed it well, that, you know, our genomic medicine, our personalized medicine, you know, is going to occur, but it can't, it's not going to occur well in our existing environments because, you know, not only do we have the genome, we've got the, um, we've got the microbiome, and we talked a little bit about that earlier, um, all the sensors, everything that's going out as far as medication, um, you know, the pharmacy, the lab, everything, you know, coalescing in one place where we've got to, you know, we've got to make sense of it. And then, you know, giving the picture back to the clinician so they can treat, as well as the, um, as well as the patients. Um, I have brought on some new team members that, you know, I hadn't thought of in the past. The one highlighted and italicized, you know, patients and families. This is, you know, all about them, so bring them in on the team. It's pretty interesting. They really can point out some very, very interesting things. Um, um, I, I have the services of co cognitive and behavioral psychologists, especially when it comes to the mobile applications that we're building and the UIs that we're building for, um, for clinicians and even analysts and others. Um, it's really, the, you know, we learned a little bit about that in the, you know, the keynote this morning, but it's really interesting when you start finding, you know, these things about ourselves that, you know, we didn't know before. And these folks are just more than happy to help out. Um, so, you know, one of the questions I always get and uh, I'll address it right now, is I don't have the skill set. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have, yeah, you guys do have access to this. You don't even know it. If you're in an academic environment, you go see the computer science folks. If you're new to, near to a university that has a computer science informatics program, you pick up the phone and you call the dean and you tell them about these wonderful research grant opportunities you probably have. And, the, um, and even the undergrads, the, 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 the graduate students and the postdocs will come I use students all the time. I embrace, you know, the academic environment, um, and we learn a lot. We develop a lot together. Um, some trends. So this definition is evolving. Don't get too caught up in it. I wouldn't. Um, um, and again, I think that if you just start with kind of a blank page in, in use cases, some that you've heard here, some that you'll hear during the conference, some that your peers you'll learn from, just, you know, figure it out, and you're going to find a lot of stuff in, in the data. You're going to, you know, find a lot. Um, on the healthcare side, um, we're now, I call it more of content analytics, right? We're giving, right now I'm giving people information. This is what's going on now. Um, at some point in time, I'll start doing some suggestive, you know, your patient's hypovolemic um, due to, you know, it's a trauma condition. You can, you know, do colloids, crystalloids, or blood products. And this is the probability of outcome, you know, based on, you know, and, you know nearest neighbor modeling and such a thing. Um, prescriptive analytics, we're definitely not there yet. I tried to do that in the early 90s, and I got my head cut off. You know, I basically got, it was just really bad. I didn't want to talk about it. Um, basically. <laughs> I had to shut down and I didn't emerge to do this kind of work for almost 15 years. So, um, so clinically, we're good at getting content. We're kind of sort of good at being suggested. We're not there to be told what to do. Absolutely not. Um, and I think you're going to see a trend of moving the analytics out of the EMR environment and then, you know, being able to push it back. Um, let's see, some takeaways. Really, don't, my, I think my biggest takeaway is don't box yourself into some type of architectural corner where you can't get out of. Because as you're doing this within healthcare, and it being fairly new to healthcare, the last thing you want to do is say, hey, you know, I know this has been going really great for two years, but guess what? We made some bad decisions, and now we've got to re-architect everything, and it's, oh, by the way, it's going to cost $3 million. You know, you don't want, you don't want to do that. Um, bring the data in now, whether you have a use case or not, because storage is relatively inexpensive, and be ready for some crazy changes. Um, try not to chase them too much because you'll end up doing this thing where you're just chasing and you're, the time will slip away from you and you won't 
you know, get anything out there. But, um, um, and I, okay, so here's the one. So Paul Boyle's in the room, and I've got like a minute. So Mercy Health is going to do, and I didn't talk about it too much. I just mentioned it. They're going to do a phenomenal um, talk about the work that they've done in streaming um, data from monitoring systems and so forth. So, and it's going to be right here. So you definitely want to make sure that you're here for that. And um, Paul and Adam are going to take care of that. Um, some of my partners um, that are here. So healthcare is very, very different. Um, so and I'll go really quick. So um, Pepper Data is a dashboard, dashboarding that I use to understand the environment. WANDISC is something that I use to um, ensure that I have high availability because I can't be down. I really can't be because you know patients, clinicians, and lives are dependent on it. Talina gives us a ability to archive data off. So I can archive data off and bring it back if I need it. I can also archive, archive data off HDFS to build, test, and you know, develop an environment. This works really well. A lot of my work has been with the folks at Tata. We've built applications for healthcare over the last eight years or so. Um, because sometimes you don't have the skill set and you got to bring people in, but you got to bring people in that, um, that actually trade off the knowledge to you, not the ones that are kind of working and you know, doing this thing and you're beholding to them for the rest of your lives. That's not a successful match. Another, su another success that I've done is I've grabbed kids right out of school that know these technologies, put them right next to the 45, 55, and 60 year olds, and they've, they've actually performed well together. So the old guys learn from the new guys, and the, the, the young guys learn some discipline from the, the older guys, and they end up having a, a pretty decent term team, and it works out really well. Um, my contact, you are free, feel free to you know, email me, um, call me. I'll be more than happy to you know, talk about you know, things, maybe help you get started and whatnot. Um, you know, there's a character, you know, Neo in the Matrix, the very last part of, of, of the first movie. You know, he basically says, you know, I can't predict the future. You know, I really can't tell you where we're going, but we've definitely started. So for healthcare, we've started. This is going to be part of our DNA at some point in time. So if you need anything from me, contact me. And thank you so much for sitting in. And I guess we get... All right, let's get started. Um, hey, everybody, my name's Don, and uh, I've got this very fancy title up here that I submitted, but um, really what I'm going to be talking about is Hadoop and Python, right? It's that simple. And uh, really what this talk is, behind the scenes, I, I'm a very honest person, I like to be upfront. What this talk is about is trying to sell you on why Hadoop and Python is cool, okay? That, that's what this is about. Um, you know, it's a 40 minute talk, so I'm not going to be able to teach you too much about how to actually do this. I'm going to sh show you some nuggets of code here and there to show you guys how easy it is and how, how you can do it. But the overall point of the talk is to give you an overview of how Hadoop works across the ecosystem, HDFS, MapReduce, Spark, uh, different smaller components, and really show you how you can use Hadoop with Python. So I hope that's what you were expecting. So a little bit about me. Um, I wrote it, I'll, I'll talk about that one last. So for the, the uh, project that I use, I'm a big Hadoop user. I've been using Hadoop since 2009. I've been using Python since 2002, 2003. Uh, some of the other kind of projects that I'm heavily involved in that I like to use a lot, one is Pig, another one is Accumulo, which I'm not gonna be talking about at all. Uh, in terms of my work history, I did a stint at Greenplum for a while doing some Hadoop stuff there. I've done a lot of work with a government contractor called Clear Edge, uh, where I did some work for DOD, did some Hadoop architecture there. And then um, most recently I have my own uh, data science consulting company that uh, I've got a small team of guys that you know, we do consulting work for people. I got my PhD at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and uh, I live in Maryland, I'm a Ravens fan, all that good stuff, Eat crab. Um, uh, I wrote a book, uh, I'm saving the best for last. I wrote a book called MapReduce Design Patterns, which is about Java MapReduce, which is always kind of funny. So like one of the things that comes up is, hey, why are you such a big proponent of Python and Hadoop? You wrote a book on Java MapReduce, and I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm working on the second edition of MapReduce Design Patterns right now, and one of the things we're adding is uh, Mr. Job, which is a way, uh, which I'll, I'll be showing you guys in a second, of how to write map, map reduce jobs in Python um, is going to be included in that book as well. So, so I'm, tr I'm trying to tie, to tie it in a little bit. So that, 
Anyways, enough about me. So one of the things I do uh, since it's 2015 and we have Google is instead of using clip art, I, uh, I Google for my clip, my, my clip art now when I do presentations. And when I Google for, for um, elephant and python and a couple of different things, th this is the image that came up. And I haven't seen this image since I was in like fifth grade. And I forget exactly what it's trying to say, but it's something about like it, the top one looks like maybe like a hat and the bottom one's like a snake that ate an elephant or something. Um, I spent like a good hour trying to figure out how I could make an analogy between this and what I was going to talk about, and I, I kind of gave up, but I, I still wanted to show you guys the picture for no re good reason at all. Um, so, so what, what I'm, <laughs> all right, so, so starting to talk about what, what I'm really going to talk about, but what does Hadoop with Python mean? What I mean is that whatever you're probably doing in Java right now, I would probably like to be doing in Python instead. So you're thinking about writing MapReduce jobs, uh, maybe I write some coordination stuff with with Python and interact with HDFS. Um, maybe I'm writing some sort of ingest pipeline, maybe I'm using Spark, maybe I'm using Storm, whatever. Right? The, my general premise here, it's not that complicated, is I want to do stuff in Hadoop with Python. And so what this talk is going to be about, it's going to be structured in, a, in three major phases. I'm going to talk about like what's good about Python with Hadoop, like conceptually what's bad about it, and then try to make some sort of opinionated discussion about when you should use one or the other, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the downfalls. And I'm going to go and do a quick like survey of the major projects that you should probably know about and give some sample code for each. And then at the end, I'm going to tie it up with like talking about what I think the community as a whole needs to be doing for Python and Hadoop. So first, let's start with the good stuff. And, and the most obvious one, this is kind of preaching in the choir here, uh, is what's good about Hadoop? Like, why would, why would a Python user want to use Hadoop? And so try to put yourself in the, these shoes. I, I've given this talk in front, more often in front of Python audience than Hadoop op audiences. So usually this is um, a little bit, this is expanded out into 15 or so slides with the Python audience, but I'm, I've compress it down to one. So the first is linear scalability. Now, I mean, this may seem obvious now in this day and age, but this was a big deal with Hadoop, right? So I can have my Python MapReduce job, let's say, and I can write it and runs on one node. I can kind of expect it to run on a thousand nodes. If I ever grow my data, you know, I can expect it to grow more. And I have this like general, con this general idea that I, things are linearly scalable, which is super powerful. The next one is schema and read and unstructured data. So uh, I don't have to load all my data into these nice, pretty schemas. I can kind of deal data with data as, as it comes in and how it is. I can deal with things like raw text, um, images, all that good stuff. Transparent parallelism is another big one. So a lot of the ways that I do parallelism in Python without Hadoop is not transparent. So you know, if I'm using like a, like a messaging queue or if I'm, if I'm dealing with threads or processes, things like that, like I know that I'm writing a parallelized application, right? It's not like I'm just writing this Python program and it behind the scenes it's magically getting parallelized. So that's one thing that's really nice about Hadoop is that it kind of hides all those parallelization, fault tolerance, and all that stuff from the user. The next one is op open source, which is, I don't know. I'm not going to spend too much time about why open source is good. I think you guys hear about that enough. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's a good thing. So overall, we want to do all, what a Python user wants to do is there's all this cool stuff that I could be doing with Hadoop in terms of these kind of four major points that I laid out here. Well, it, it, the first three major points is that I want to do those things with Python, and I want to do it in an open source way. And Hadoop's perfect for that. But there's some gaps, and I'm going to talk about those gaps. So the next one is uh, succinct code, which is in your title. And this is a, a big reason why I, I like Hadoop, so, uh, or Python, rather. So th this comic is pretty classic. Th there's also like a, another like eight panels or something for other languages, but the Python and Java one, um, so th the guy with the glasses is kind of commenting about how with the Python, it seemed like too easy, you know, you just did import. And then um, with Java, I'm two pages in and I still have no idea what you're saying. So, I mean, I'll walk into a new customer or something like that. I'll look at some of their MapReduce code. It takes me a good like 15 minutes to figure out what this Java MapReduce program is doing, right? Um, it, it's just it's just long, right? It's just a it's just it's a big piece of code, and it doesn't flow very nicely, and um, it just it's just hard to, to digest. It's almost like you have to read it over and over and over again to really figure out what you're saying. In Python, um, what I'm really saying is that. I think that when you're writing these things in Python, it's, it's easier for me to figure out what the code is saying because it's more succinct, it's a little bit higher level. Um, 
it's a little, little bit easier to digest. So th the, the first thing I, I want to point out is on the bottom right here, I, on the slides in which I'm stating my personal opinion based on, I don't know, I try to talk a little bit about why I was credible at the beginning of this, of this thing, but I, I added warning signs about like, okay, this is my opinion now. I'm not like, I haven't performed some sort of research study or anything, right? This is just my personal opinion. If you want to believe me, then good. If, if you want to argue with me, then come talk to me afterwards, I guess. Uh, but don't try to embarrass me in public. So the first one is, is faster development. So when I sit down and write a Java MapReduce job versus when I sit down and write a Python MapReduce job or pretty much in every single scenario, if I'm going to do it in Python versus I'm going to do it in, in Java, doing it in Python is going to be faster, okay? I'm not making any, it really that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying it's easier. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying it's faster, okay? Okay, opinion number one. Next one is less enterprisey. Um, I, you know, <laughs> all right, it's the first time I ever got a clap in the middle of the talk. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what I mean by less enterprisey. It's more of a feeling. It's more of about like a, like a sense that I get when I'm writing code. I don't feel like I'm, you know, I feel like I'm like in a cafe shop or something. I'm writing code. I don't feel like I'm in like a cube farm, uh, and and. What, okay, so, so what I really mean about enterprise is that uh, I'm not writing like enterprise code, right? I'm writing code that's to me feels, uh, this is a very feeling kind of thing. The code feels like I'm, I'm more directly talking to the computer and I'm, and I'm doing, it's a little bit closer working with my data. Meanwhile in Java, I'm sitting there thinking like, oh, like, well I need to create this object and I need to create this like abstract factory factory and it, like, so I, I, I think there's some advantages here to, uh, to being less enterprisey. I think the next big one is lower barrier of entry as well. So it, uh, a lot of universities, for example, have switched to Python as their introductory language for teaching uh, computer science. I think there's a lot of merits. Again, this is opinion um, that say that Python maybe is easier to learn. So in some organizations, for example, I've seen, it's not necessarily that so some of these smart people couldn't learn Java, it's just they're, they're more scared of it. I think when you have some people like statisticians or, or uh, data scientists, for example, that haven't don't have a really strong programming background. I've generally seen that these people are are more comfortable with Python. So the next big overarching thing that I really like about Python, which I think is undersold a little bit, is that Python naturally is interpreted, and then Java, I guess, is compiled. I guess, kind of. I guess there's a bit nuance there, but okay. So. One thing that I really like to do is change code in place, okay? So like, uh, uh, th there's probably a lot of people that I work with that hate me for doing this, but I want to SSH into my cluster, edit my Python script, and then rerun it and see how it works, right? Like, I, I wanna be interactive with my, my Hadoop cluster and I wanna be iterating quickly. Um, like, let's take the, the, com the other side, right? If I'm developing a Java MapReduce job, right? I'm developing it in Eclipse in my local workstation, right? I compile it, I send it, I guess my jars to the Hadoop cluster. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of easier ways to do this these days, but this is one way, right? I su submit my jars uh, up to the cluster, I run it. Oh, you know, I accidentally have a less than sign than a greater sign. Okay, well let me go back to Eclipse, change it, recompile it, move it. Like, this seems kind of trivial, but over time it's one of those things that wears on your soul and um, just over time, I just flip out, right? So I, th I think th this is something that's convenient for me that, uh, I mean, over time that I really like. This one, ag again, is, op is opinion. Um, I think continuous in integration when I'm just dealing with scripts opposed to like compiled things, right? I don't need some sort of server that's compiling things and making sure it builds and everything. There's pros and cons to this, right? So not, ev not everything here is perfect, but I think I've seen in some situations like continuous in integration with Python be a little bit at least easier to implement. Um, the other one is more platform portable, which is kind of ridiculous because I think that's why Java was built to begin with, right? Um, so I've seen, for example, like they updated the Hadoop cluster and then people are still compiling Java on their local workstation, like compiling their Java MapReduce on their local workstation, moving up the jars, and then like the versions of Hadoop are mismatched and then everything breaks. Um, like a Python script, on the other hand, you update the interpreter or the libraries underneath in general, like I feel safer about that. I mean, 
it's, it's not that I run into this problem a lot with Java, but it, it, it definitely makes me feel safer and the code's a little bit more portable. Um, again, opinion here. So the next one is um, Python libraries for data. And, I, and so I, I gave a, a tutorial on uh, Python and Hadoop at PyCon this past year, or a few months ago in Montreal. And likewise, that was a Python audience, right? And while this, I believe, is a Hadoop audience. And at PyCon, there's a, there's a big hype about data and data analysis. So the Python community is really all hyped up about data analysis. So a lot of the tutorials are data related. You know, there I think like data uh, um, web frameworks, for example, are starting to get a little bit more boring, I guess. And uh, people are starting to figure out that data analysis with Python is pretty cool. So um, I think one of the good things is that Python has a lot of momentum in data analysis right now. And I think one of the good things is that if we did hi Python with Hadoop, then we could kind of leverage some of that momentum that that community has. The next one is uh, tighter integration with data science. Uh, uh, I didn't know what to do with this bullet point. Um, I think what I mean here is that a lot of data scientists right now are using Python and they prefer Python for their non-big data workloads, right? And, and I'm one of those people. And if I'm doing some, so kind of one of the things I used to do when I used to do like maybe some of the more machine learning stuff that I like to do in Python, or e even this is true argument with R, is that th maybe like in 2011-ish, um, what I would do is I would write a Java MapReduce job that would maybe build my feature vector or something like that. I would output that thing and then I'd run a Python script over it, right? But with some of the Python Hadoop stuff that exists right now, I can just end to end use Python, which is kind of nice. So in a data scientist environment, you know, that's great. It's just, it's just more convenient, right? It's not a big, big deal, but it's convenient. The other thing too is that Python has a lot of like really first class libraries. So, I mean, every, every language has its own libraries, right? But Python's data analysis libraries are actually really, really good in my opinion. And that's one of the reasons why I stick with Python. Some of these are like Pandas, which is a data analysis library that mimics a lot of like R data frames. Um, you got scikit-learn, which is a very comprehensive machine learning library. NLTK is a great uh, natural language processing library. NumPy and SciPy provide a lot of the foundation of um, fast data structures, matrices and, uh, and arrays, things like that. Jensen is a topic modeling framework. Uh, Matplotlib is a fantastic pl plotting library. So these libraries are really great. And in some cases, I like them better, a as somebody that's proficient in Java as well, I like them better than the Java c counterparts, just as like a functionality, uh, what they're able to do, things like that. So I kind of miss these things. And, and so when I'm doing Hadoop stuff and I want to be using these two things together, you know, sometimes I have a hard time dealing with that. Yeah. All right, for the bad. So here we are back again at Enterprisey. Um, there are some good things about being Enterprisey, right? That's why like we even got here. Um, some of the things in particular are when I work on larger teams, for example, where we have shared code, Sometimes the enterpriseness of the Java code that we're writing is good for collaboration. Um, Python can get really sloppy. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, uh, I, I don't know who, who to attribute it to, but uh, Java lets both really good programmers and really bad programmers write mediocre code. Um, and, and there's a little bit of truth to that. So basically, it forces everybody, uh, it's pretty strict in, in the, what the code that comes out of that, you know, you've got type safety and you've got classes and interfaces and things like that. It makes it so that interacting with the code is pretty straightforward. In Python, it's a little bit looser. So bad programmers can write bad code and good programmers, programmers can write good code and there's also different styles. Like I could write in a more functional style, I can write in a more procedural style. And so with kind of more enterprise code, when you're sharing code on larger projects, I find that Java may be better because it, um, it, it it kind of enforces some things in by the nature of the code. Meanwhile, with Python, if you're on a large project, I find that you need to have good coding standards, good code reviews, things like that to compensate. The next one is type safety. So ty type safety is pretty p important in my opinion, especially with dealing with data because I'm dealing with data, right? I've got like, is this an integer or is it a string? Or is it a integer encoded as a string? Um, you know, these things get really complicated and when different pieces of code start passing back and forth, you can run into a lot of issues when you're not being super careful about type safety. Especially in Python, a lot of the Python frameworks, um, both 
the normal Python frameworks and the, and the Hadoop ones will make assumptions about data types, automatically converting things to strings or integers, things like that. And that can like really lead to some trouble uh, and troubleshooting things that are kind of difficult. The next one is no JVM sa sandbox safety. So some of the Python um, on Hadoop libraries will start up a Python interpreter, a C Python interpreter on the outside, and that's outside of JVM land, right? So if you fork a bunch of times or if you take up a bunch of memory, right, there's, there's less safety. So there is some things to be said about the JVM in this environment with Hadoop kind of providing that sandbox so that you don't do anything too crazy. I think there's some ways to still solve this problem in, in Python, but for Java, you kind of get it for free. On the other hand, though, um, I do like this sometimes, right? Like sometimes I don't want the JVM to tell me how much memory I can have and things like that. If I ha maybe have a little bit more power and I'm competent, then uh, you know I, I like to live on the dangerous side a little bit and, uh, and use all the RAM that I want. The next one is performance. So uh, there's also just the general Python versus Java performance, but then we'll also get into some of the reasons why performance are, is a big problem in, in Hadoop and Python. So I think these are kind of the, the outline of the bad ones, but I only have one bad slide. I had like four good slides just to just to keep my bias straight. All right, so to, to summarize the good and bad, and this is really just trying to say like, me personally, w if I have both Python and Hadoop and just regular Java Hadoop in the environment where I kind of draw the line, for the most part, when I'm doing like data analysis or data science where I almost feel like I'm querying the data, right? Like I'm sending a query to the data, I'm getting some answers back, maybe I'm iterating a little bit, it's all throwaway code. You know, this is like, for example, if I was writing SQL at a terminal, right? That's kind of maybe what this, this feels like. Um, if I'm turning into some sort of production code or something like that, or if it's a data pipeline, or if it's like a ETL process that's writing into Hive, or if it's a ETL process that's writing into some database down the line, or if it's building a report every day, things like that, that's something that I still maybe trust Java MapReduce with a little bit better, um, mostly because of performance and um, just kind of maintainability. The, the one thing though that I really want to point out is that the good and the bads that I outlined so far in this talk, they're different strengths for everybody, right? So if you're only doing like ETL jobs in your Hadoop cluster, then maybe I would argue that you know, some of the goods that I outlined are not as important to you and some of the bads are more important to you, right? So I, it's very hard for me to say like, you should definitely use Python for this problem and you should definitely use Hadoop for this problem or Python or Java for this problem. So let's talk a little bit about the ugly things here because there's always the good, bad and the ugly, right? Um, so, first of all, nothing in Hadoop is native in Python. Everything in Hadoop, for the most part, is written in Java. So, when you're using Python with Hadoop across the ecosystem here, pretty much nothing is native, meaning that everything has to go some through some sort of serialization or um, translation or some so sort of intermediary, and th this is the general case. And, and that's, that's bad for a number of reasons, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The next one is uh, kind of related to that is that performance can become really, really bad. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit where because of this non-nativeness, um, the serialization overhead or the inter-process communication overhead of dealing with this Python interpreter that's side saddling or serializing in between different things, the per performance can de degrade to like an order of magnitude or w uh, to a point where you're like, wow, this is actually really slow. Um, the next one is Python bindings are always almost always behind if they even exist. So first of all, since nothing's native and nothing's supported in the mainline projects, let's say there's some sort of update to MapReduce, right? The Python project then is like, oh, wow, they made an update to MapReduce, let's go fix it. And then they, they take a few months to do that, right? So they're almost like always a step behind the, the trunks of the main projects. The next one is that nothing here is officially sanctioned. So these Python projects, Python and Hadoop, they, they're, they're like almost always in some random guy's GitHub repo. Like, I, uh, so, so the line I have here is that um, like I'll clone a repo and just, just, just hope that it works. Like, okay, it compiled, okay, it great. Like uh, it's step, step one, step one, okay, I got it compiled. And then actually seeing it work on my actual Hadoop cluster is like another feat, right? Um, I would say typically I might have to do on the order of one to five lines of code change in some of these projects, even the more popular ones, to get it to work in my current environment. So um, the fact that these things aren't 
you know, th there's not like a clutter or Hortonworks behind the scenes that's integration testing all this stuff. And there's a little bit of onus that's put on the user, and th and that's kind of unfortunate. So I'm going to go through some of the. So now that I've kind of talked about like why you, you should probably be doing this or not doing this, I'm going to go over the some of the projects pretty quickly, just kind of as an overview. So the first one is Mr. Job. I originally called it MR Job, but then somebody called it Mr. Job, and I thought that was pretty cool. So I'm going to keep doing that. Um, and what this allows you to do is it allows you to write MapReduce jobs in Python, pretty straightforward. Um, it was open source and maintained still by Yelp. Uh, Yelp has actually done a lot of cool open source stuff and a lot of Python stuff, so I'm a big fan of there. And basically what it does is it wraps Hadoop streaming. So Hadoop streaming is this interface where you can pass in arbitrary scripts that take in standard in and standard out and then write MapReduce jobs. So what it does is it wraps Hadoop streaming and kind of removes some of the quirks of it and allows you to write these very succinct like MapReduce jobs. So in this case here, I have, uh, I have word count um, because w what else would I show you guys? Uh, I have the mapper and I have the reducer, which in the Java MapReduce sense should look pre pretty familiar, except that the code is really, really short, right? Um, I have a class, I have mapper, reducer. Um, they're Python functions. You notice that I have no types. That's kind of where this, the type safety problems come in. Um, yeah. Mr. Job is fantastic. I, th th this is what I use mostly for, for my MapReduce jobs. There's another one called PyDoop as well. It basically does the same thing, but it's implemented in a different way. This uses Hadoop's um, C++ pipes, which should be faster than streaming. But I have, I have never seen anybody really do a big comparison between PyDoop and, and Mr. Job, so I'm not really sure uh, which one's better. But f from a feature set perspective, they seem pretty, pretty good. Like they both handle similar things. So I would say like just pick one and see which one you like better. Uh, th th they seem pretty similar. This is from a blog post from Cloudera that was published uh, a little bit too long ago in 2013 that uh, did an overview of some of the major um, Python projects. If, if you Google for like Python MapReduce or something, th this blog post is one of the first hits. And what this slide says is basically they gave performance numbers on um, the different Python Hadoop projects. What you'll see is that the way you read this is that Darker red is very bad, and green is okay. So what you'll see is in streaming that streaming is is not that much slower. So streaming is the one where you can pass an arbitrary standard in, standard out. You know, at, at worst in this case it was like 1.7 ish slower. So worst case like 2x. And you look at my favorite guy, Mr. Job over here, um, in the job runtime, which is in the bot bottom. That was 7.3 times slower than MapReduce. Um, to to s to save this a little bit, th there was some pretty naive way that they did serialization in Mr. Job back when this benchmark was ran, and they've since have improved it. So I would still say it's faster than 7.3x, but it's still probably significantly slower. So if you care about like, you know, that my MapReduce job is taking 12 minutes instead of three, or 12 minutes instead of six, or something like that, then, then maybe this isn't the right, the right approach for you. Uh, they have Dumbo and Hadoop in, in here as well, which are both projects that are still on GitHub, but haven't seen a commit in like over six to 12 months. So there are some other options out there that, that have kind of died off um, in the meantime. Um, the next project I want to talk to you about is Pig, which is, I don't know, maybe surprising, but I really like Pig in general. And then, and also I like Pig a lot because of a lot of the same reasons that I talk about with Python. So Pig is interpreted in a sense. Um, I can edit it in place. Maintaining it is easier to sync. So Pig is almost like, in a lot of senses, the Python to MapReduce already. And then with uh, Python UDFs, I can use like the power of Python with Pig. So typically what I'll do, actually Pig with Python is probably one of my favorite combinations that I use a lot. And what it allows me to do is I write the kind of large scale data flow stuff in my Pig job and then I'll have the data manipulation, data analysis stuff in Python that's attached to it. And so here, for example, there's a, there's a Pig script here on the left and then I have like two sample UDFs here on the right there's nothing really surprising here. The UDFs just take in a, a, a parameter, return something. It has notions of bags. In, bags in Python are translated to a, a, a list. Tuples are tuples in Python. And then you can return string, strings and integers and things like that. Um, I, I'm just a big fan of this. The, the one thing to really note, though, is that um, in, in pig here, there's two ways to write Python UDFs. There's one using Dython and one using CPython. So, and, and this is an important thing to note if you're using a Python in Hadoop library, is what kind of Python is it using underneath? 
So Jython is the Python interpreter write, written in Java, which allows you to write run Python scripts inside of the JVM. Now that's great because it's generally faster. There's it's running inside of the JVM. There's no IPC. It's just all running in there. The downside is that the Jython stuff can't leverage a lot of the underlying C functionality that the tip the, the mainline C Python interpreter has. So the bad thing that happens there is that you basically throw out NumPy, SciPy, and all the machine learning libraries and all those libraries I listed earlier. So I'll use Jython if I'm just doing, doing like string manipulation, things like that. But if I'm trying to call out to NLPK or scikit-learn or something like that, then I use the, the CPython one, which is a little bit slower. Because what the CPython one does is it starts up a Python interpreter outside of the JVM, funnels the data to the, to the interpreter, and then brings it back, which is just slow from an operation standpoint. But it's cool that I have the, op the, the ability to do both. Um, the next project I want to talk about is um, Snakebite. So Snakebite. Uh, was open source out of Spotify. And the reason why the, um, so Snakebite is like an HDFS client. And the reason the, but why the Spotify guys built this was actually quite interesting. They had this uh, workflow pipeline thing that um, had lots of operations per second on the main node. And their bottleneck was JVM startup time. So they would do Hadoop FS OS, JVM starts up, they do the LS which pairs down. There's ways to solve that problem, but what they ended up doing was they ended up doing like a, like a native protobuf, I think it's protobuf, to communicate with HDFS and, br and bring the information back. The downside is that reverse engineering the protocol to communicate with HDFS ended up being actually really hard. So pretty much all they support is uh, name node ops, like ls, move, things like that. And they support reading from files, but you can't write files yet with, uh, with Snakebite. And I don't know if they'll, if they'll ever get there. But Snakebite's really cool. For example, if I write a Mr. Job that's doing some MapReduce stuff, and then I have to like move around some files after it, or maybe I need to open up a file and run it through scikit-learn or something like that. Um, Snakebite's pretty good at, the, at, at that. Uh, the next one is um, interaction with HBase. So there's two projects out there called Starbase and HappyBase. Um, both of them use the HBase Thrift gateway, which is incredibly slow because instead of going directly to the region servers, it's it's getting funneled through this gateway. I mean, the, the gateway has merits for uh, for a number of reasons, but it is slower. Um, but unfortunately for both of these guys, the last commits were about six months ago, and even six months ago when the last commit happened, they were didn't really work that well anyways. Um, so I think in general, I think Python plus HBase kind of lost momentum, and I don't really know anybody that's working on this. So um, one time I was giving a talk, somebody got really mad. He's like, wow, well, this would be really cool for me. I was like, okay, well, you know, submit some pull requests, I guess. Um, so yeah. Uh, the next one is uh, PySpark. So I'm really happy about PySpark. So the Spark guys, uh, I don't know, ho hopefully you've heard about Spark at this point, but I get if not, then Spark, Spark is like an alternative to MapReduce where uh, I store these data, data in these resilient uh, distributed data sets that are in memory, and then I can manipulate these RDBs in memory. And the PySpark or the Spark guys have pretty good interfaces in both in Java, Scala, and Python. Um, and the Python stuff fell behind for a little bit, but then they started catching up, which is great. Um, so here's like a PySpark example of, of word count. It's a little bit more verbose than um, uh, than the Mr. Job stuff, but still it's pretty pretty concise, and it's a little bit higher level than um, uh, than than Mapper So so in general, big fan. I, I'm I'm really happy that the Spark guys are keeping up with the Python interfaces. So this is a great way to interact with your Hadoop data as well. So. I wanted to have some closing thoughts, especially if there's anybody in here that's like a vendor or somebody that has money that they're paying, you're pumping into open source. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about the projects that are here, and I talked a little, a lot about the downfalls of these things. And hopefully, you're not too scared at this point, because I think there's some projects out there, you know, that are maintained from different people and they're in different places. But there's a lot of work to do. And so now this part of the talk is where I try to convince you guys that this is important and that maybe some of you should start working on it. So this one is a screenshot from the, uh, from the GitHub repo for Cassandra's Python driver. Um, and if you look, these are the number of commits. Uh, and, and there's a lot. And the other thing that I want you to, I want to point out is that um, the, the top four committers and then additional past that are Datastax employees. So the Cassandra guys are paying their employees to develop the Python driver, okay? And, and that's important because now Cassandra can have all these Python people want to use Cassandra, right? 
So if a Python guy sitting there is like, hey, I want a big table like thing, and they look at Cassandra and they look at HBase, I mean, I think my, my, my decision is pretty easy, right? Let's look at another one. Uh, let's look at MongoDB. So MongoDB um, has been working on their Python driver since 2009. They really started ramping up in 2011, right? So again, and also too, the other p thing to point out, the top committers are from the MongoDB company. So these aren't just like random guys. Like like for the for Mr. Job, for example, the top committers are Yelp guys. Okay, uh, and I love those guys. They, they're they're doing God's work, right? But at the end of the day, like some money needs to be pumped into this thing. So I think to to kind of try to motivate the Hadoop crowd here to say that this is important and maybe should get focused on a little bit is that my pipe. My Python on Hadoop tutorial at the Python conference was sold out. And there was a lot of interest. I generated a lot of interest on it. And if the Hadoop community did a little bit of better job interacting with the Python community, there's going to be a ton of new people coming into this field. And I don't know, maybe that's bad for me as a consultant. But, um, but in, in general, like now that we're moving into just writing data pipelines and stuff, and people are trying to do data science on Hadoop and all that good stuff, this is really important. Python is, has a lot of momentum, and if we can just carry some of the momentum, it would be really good for the Hadoop community. community. So, um, so yeah, so I hate cloning random things on GitHub and hoping they compile. I hate that some of my customers that I'm recommending using Python can't call their support vendor and get help with it. Um, and also, too, these people are just ra making random APIs and things like that and aren't able to, it's, it's the, the ecosystem is not very cohesive. So. That's my kind of call to call to action for somebody in here to actually uh, to help to help out with this. All right, so that's all I got. I'll be happy to take questions for the next five minutes or so. Thanks, guys. What about a uh, client for Hive in Python? Do you know? Good so, one? so in Python, you can use Hive UDF. Like I you can write hi Python UDFs in Hive, right? I believe uh, the other way around, uh, just calling oh. uh, Hive SQL. From calling Hive SQL from Python. Python I, yeah. th does anybody have an answer to that? I I've never tried. Okay, Pi Hive library. Okay, I'll, I I'm actually going to check that out. Pi HS two. Okay. So it has Presto support. I, I'm I'm repeating so that it gets recorded. Okay, cool, thanks. Yep. Yeah, uh, I just want to add a follow up to that. So PyHS2, the guy posted on GitHub yesterday that he's retiring his um, maintenance, maintenance to that project. So if anyone wants to take that over, it'd be great. I mean, I'm going to listen to it because we're starting to use it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, thanks everybody. I'll I'll stick around for a few minutes. Thanks. <laughs>